Greetings and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Islamophobia podcast from the Bridge Initiative at Georgetown University. My name is Arsalan Iftikhar. I am an international human rights lawyer, senior fellow at the Bridge Initiative, and author of the book Fear of a Muslim Planet, Global Islamophobia in the New World Order. My guest today is Dr. Susan Carland, who is an Australian academic author and television presenter, best known for her ongoing media presence, speaking on her academic specialty of women in Islam. She has written numerous articles and writings in local and international newspapers, academic journals, and books and magazines, and has presented her research to the United Nations in Geneva. Dr. Carlin has also been named to the list of 500 most influential Muslims in the world, and also once featured as one of the top 20 most influential Australian female voices from the Age newspaper. Dr. Susan Carland, assalamu alaikum, and thank you for joining us today. Wa alaikum salam wa salam. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Me too, uh, because, you know, when you were actually here in Washington, D.C. a few months back uh, during your visit to the United States, uh, talking to people about Islamophobia, we, we met for coffee and we discussed the intricacies and nuances of Islamophobia around the world. Now, as experts, you and I both know that Islamophobia in America is different than European Islamophobia, which is different than Chinese Islamophobia. And, you know, Australia, let's be honest, it's the only country in the world which is also a continent. So that's why I wanted to do an entire episode on Islamophobia in Australia. And that's why I reached out to you. So my first question to you, uh, Dr. Susan Carland, is, you know, for Australians and Australian Muslims, how has Islamophobia changed in Australia over the last two decades? And, and what does Islamophobia in Australia look like today in the year 2023? Mm. Yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously September 11 was a big moment for Islamophobia in Australia, obviously, uh, as it was in so many countries around the world. Islamophobia did exist in Australia before then, and you could certainly, and, and some scholars have made a very compelling case that the ground work that was being done on by certain government policies and community attitudes right from the 80s um, sort of laid a nice groundwork for the, the Islamophobic response we saw to 9-11. Um, but 9-11 was a really interesting moment in Australia because obviously, you know, the horror of, of what happened and it was shocking and terrifying. Yeah. It also happened in a really interesting moment in Australia politically in that a few months before um, September 11, a boat of mostly Afghan asylum seekers had come into uh, Australian waters, what near Australian waters, yeah. and their boat had died and they'd been rescued by a Swedish cargo ship. And the Swedish cargo ship wanted to bring them into Australian waters for them to be looked after so Australia could uh, fulfil its human rights obligations that it had signed up to. And at that moment, the Australian Prime Minister um, didn't want to let them in. He decided that he'd had enough of what they saw as illegal, quote, unquote, immigrants coming into Australia by boat. Um, yeah. And he refused to let them off the ship. And what happened was there was this stoush for months, a legal stoush between can these Afghan asylum seekers come into Australia or must they, can, can Australia reject, reject them and say they're not coming in? And while this battle was playing out, even in the High Court in Australia, September 11 happened. And what that meant was that as well as the horror of it and the fear of it and the Islamophobia that was uh, naturally generated from it, it also had a massive impact on Australia's refugee policy because what happened was those men went from being Afghan asylum seekers to being potentially terrorists. Afghan asylum seekers who were trying to get into Australia and God knows if they were going to try to do what happened in New York. And so that then laid the groundwork for some really harsh asylum seeker policies that Australia had. And what that meant is that in the Australian imagination, asylum seekers and Muslims and terrorists were always conflated. So that kind of, that was sort of the Australian additional element to what happened with September 11. And then from September 11, like in so many other countries, Western countries in particular, it was it was kind of really, it's been, you know, the last 20 or so years has been a really unfortunate hit parade of events, both overseas and in Australia, that have meant that 
Muslims have always stayed in the public imagination generally as an item of fear and um, loathing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, it really, it didn't really change significantly, I have to say, until 2019 when there was the Christchurch terrorist attack, which uh, we can talk about if you want. But that seemed to change things a lot in Australia. Yeah, uh, just as a follow up, uh, you know, can you tell uh, our audience a little bit about the One Australia policy, which was released in 1988, uh, and, and how that uh, call for an end to multiculturalism and sort of uh, a mono, monolithic Australian identity, how that impacted Islamophobia? Yeah, well, if we really probably need to take it back a lot further, which was to federation when Australia federated in 1901. So when Australia, we kind of copied America in some ways. We we went from these separate colonies or states to becoming a united nation. Okay. Um, and so we federated in, in 1901. And one of the first policies Australia enacted, which tells you a lot about the Australian psyche, I think, was what colloquially was referred to as the white Australia policy. And what that meant was that um, Australia really only wanted white people to come in and they made that very clear. Now there was a tension because Australia was still part of Britain uh, about the legality of this. And so the way this was very neatly got around was that um, Australia said, what we're going to do is we're going to implement a dictation test. So anyone who wants to come to Australia, We will just give them a dictation test to make sure um, they can speak appropriately. Now, on the surface, you might think, okay, well, I guess that's reasonable. But what they actually did, and this was openly done, this isn't a conspiracy theory, this is is fact. Um, The immigration officers would issue the dictation test in whatever language they wanted. So if you were someone who was coming from a country that was they didn't want, if you were coming from China or India or wherever else, Mm -hmm. they could issue your dictation test in Russian. Really? They wanted in Hebrew. And there were cases of them just going through dictation test after dictation test in different languages, trying to find a language that the immigrant couldn't speak so that they could reject them. Um, But what it meant was ostensibly it looked like this was more just about education and linguistics. It had nothing to do with culture, but of course it was. It was a clearly racial policy. And that, that existed in Australia for a long time. So that impacted obviously not just Muslims coming into Australia, but the types of Muslims that could come and when. So you'll find the earliest waves of Muslim migration from that point on, from 1901, Mm -hmm. um, were from the more white-looking countries. So the Albanians are some of the oldest Muslim communities in Australia and the Bosnians. Um, as the as things started to change, and then obviously in the in the seventies, Australia had a change to an openly multicultural policy. They said we've got to change this, and and things um, that it opened up a lot. But even then, uh, there were still um, issues with who could come in and from which country, and and because of that long standing um, attitude that was really cultivated in Australia about who came in and what we think of them. It's not like you can just flick flick a switch and suddenly we go from having an openly white Australia policy to saying, well, now everyone's welcome and everything's great. There were, you know, it, there were still, even if people could technically come in uh, from from wherever, that mm-hmm. didn't mean the community necessarily felt felt great about it. Interesting. And so, uh, you know, a, a lot of people tend to think that Islamophobia is a, is a monolithic entity. And we obviously know that Islamophobia in different parts of the world um, are different. And so I would love if you could tell our audience a little bit about the unique elements uh, to Australian Islamophobia, particularly vis-a-vis the United States, the UK and Europe. I mean, what are some similarities that you see in the Islamophobia there? And more importantly, what are some of the differences or the distinctions that you think are are sort of exclusive or unique to Australian Islamophobia? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of similarities. You know, this this beast of Islamophobia, it manifests very similarly in a lot of sort of commensurate Western countries like Australia, in New Zealand, Canada, the US, UK. Um, but then we'll all have our own little pockets of, of difference, our own unique flavours uh, oh, to them. So the, I think the first thing to know about Australian Islam and how it compares to other places is there's really not a lot of Muslims in Australia at all. Only 3.2% of the population is Muslim, which is only about 800,000 people. You know, there's only 26 million people in all of Australia. Okay. So there's a very small number of Muslims. Okay. And of course, what that means then is a lot of people have never 
had a Muslim friend or a colleague or neighbor. And so that really skews the perception because all they really know about Islam is what they see in the media. You know, we all, you know, we all know what that is like. Um, So there's not a lot of Muslims and the attitudes towards Muslims are pretty negative in Australia. And a number of studies have affirmed this one decade long study uh, so, which was important because it made sure this wasn't just a blip in the radar. This is a consistent view. Found that 50% of Australians self-identified as having anti-Muslim attitudes. So that's right. half. And that's right. not yeah. me telling them, you know, you're, you hate Muslims. Right. That's them saying it about themselves. I don't like these. I don't like Muslims. That was them saying it about themselves. And this attitude, this and that similar statistic has been repeated by a number of different studies. So that's not an aberration. Okay. Um, okay. We also... W- a, a, Another unfortunate um, instance is after the Christchurch terrorist attack, which was in 2019, when an Australian man went into um, two yeah. mosques. Oh, we're going to talk about that, don't worry. Yeah, okay, great. So you know about that. I do. When that happened, um, obviously horrific, and it was very deeply personal for Australians, obviously, because this was an Australian man, and we're very close to New Zealand. We have a lot of tight ties with New Zealand. So it was a lot for Australia to grapple right. with. Um shockingly what we found is that after that attack mm. reports of islamophobic attacks on muslims in australia increased fourfold so you would think when something like that happened that people would be like oh my gosh this is horrific yeah, be the other way but around. it actually it, it, it gave a permission it, it it created a permissibility um so that's kind of where we were at you know where we are at so and you know the similarities between um you know Australia and the US and and the UK that there'd be similarities between just the way the Muslim is um portrayed that they are a challenge to our values you know that's certainly the case here are they are they they used as much as political footballs uh like oh yeah the Republicans and Democrats do here tell us a little bit about sort of uh you know I know there was uh, there was some Pauline lady a couple years ago with the burqa stunt and yeah like tell us a little bit (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Islamophobia in, in Australian politics. It is. It, it and this is why Christchurch was such a significant moment. So we'll get to that. Yes. That'll be how we'll we'll end it. Because up until then, really from September 11 mm-hmm. until the Christchurch terrorist attack, right. it was just it was really um open open season on Muslims uh by yes. po- politicians across e- the spectrum. Even though Australia is sort of known as a liberal enclave, like is it what's uh, does the liberalism end at muslims in australia i think it's it certainly can because it was you know it's couched in ways where um being scared of muslims or having draconian uh security attitudes towards muslims or seeing muslims as a threat or a problem it was it was framed as well this is a safe and common sense attitude to have these muslims are violent they are misogynistic they are a threat and a, a danger to our values as australians and what it means to be australian so this is actually a very reasonable response um and so yeah there was a lot of often talk about a hijab and the burqa like you said we had we had a politician who is very fringe i have to say but um gets a lot of attention because she says and does pretty extreme we have, things. We, have we got plenty of those over here susan don't worry <laughs> yeah yeah, you know what I mean. I um, but she did wear a burqa into Parliament and she pulled it off in this kind of Scooby-Doo-esque moment where the villain reveals themselves and says, it was me all along. You know, it was this it was this massive uh, stunt to try to show that why this is why the burqa is bad and it should be banned. And this comes up a lot. Politicians, not just the fringe ones like her either, not just sort of the, 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 the nutty, you know, p- uh, pundits on strange tv networks or internet our mainstream politicians would repeatedly say these things certainly from more parties than the other but it would not be uncommon for these things to be said to be constantly framing muslims as a threat uh, as a danger to our values and as a problem and as people who just won't integrate this was said again and again and this was what was why Christchurch was such a flipping point for um, us. And I've seen it as a sociologist of religion, but also as a Muslim who lives here. When Christchurch happened, since then, we have not had any mainstream politicians come out and say anything negative about Muslims' place in Australia. And I wonder if it was because suddenly the horrific, deadly potential of Islamophobia was writ large and we realized this is where these comments can end up because like i said australia had to take a real personal a personal reckoning with itself about what happened and our role in it um so i think so we haven't had any 
Uh, it, and and that's politicians on both of the main parties haven't said anything really critical about um, Muslims in Australia since then. But also, I mean, I have to be honest with you, like it, it's yes, that that was an important moment. But things politically have been incredibly different since then. We've had COVID, so there have been different changes. The threat of right wing extremism in Australia is now much more pronounced than just focusing on um, Islamic terrorism or, or Muslim terrorism. Um, so we've had those sort of changes happen that, of course, have changed the nature of the focus. We haven't had any big terrorist attacks here in Australia or overseas. And I do think that, you know, things are pretty calm and, and quiet in Australia in terms of being a Muslim at the moment. But I do think all it would take would be one terrorist attack. And I think thing, things could change again. And, uh, you know, just diving a little into gendered Islamophobia, as, as we know, um, you know, Islamophobia towards Muslim women, uh, particularly those who are visibly Muslim women in different parts of the world, can manifest in different ways, right? So after 9-11, obviously, you saw a spike in hate crimes in here in the U.S., against a predominantly, you know, visibly Muslim women in the EU, you have legislative bans, right? You have the burqa ban, the hijab ban, the burkini ban, the list goes on and on. Um, can you tell us, a little, is, well, first of all, is 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 Islamophobia gendered in, in Australia? And are do you see the parallel in terms of gendered Islamophobia closer to the U.S. analogy of more sort of the physical hate crimes and sort of the day-to-day -day, or more on the legislative side similar to the EU with the burkini and the hijab bans that we see all across the EU? Yeah, that is a great question. Definitely much more similar to the US. So like my right to wear a hijab is protected in Australia. Um, so I couldn't be fired from my job for wearing a hijab. Yeah. That's that would be that would be seen as a discrimination that's protected. So that's an important distinction to say what's happening in France, for example. Um, so we it, it is, but we do definitely have, uh, you know, instances of uh, Islamophobic attack on men and women. And I think it's gendered in a couple of important ways. It's gendered towards women in that, uh, you know, as you alluded to, if you're a Muslim woman who wears the hijab or covers her face or anything like that, you're standing out. So there mm -hmm. is that, um, there's a visibility element to it. And a lot of people just don't like the hijab. Like we just have to be honest. There was a study that was done just in the state that I live in, which is really known as the most multicultural and most accepting state in Australia. Okay. Um, it's always been very proudly multicultural, no matter who our, it's what we call um, our premier, which is like our, um, uh, I've forgotten. What's the name of the, who runs your state? Governor, uh, governor, governor, yeah, the equivalent of the governor. Um, no matter which party the governor or premier has come from in Victoria, they've always been pretty pro multicultural. Okay. But even in Victoria, um, a, a really recent study found that one third of Victorians believe that a Muslim woman shouldn't be allowed to wear the hijab. So, not even that they just don't like it, but they think it should be that, that they, no agency is involved, right. Right. And what's significant about this research is they found that for mo for all other groups, Victorians are really positive about multiculturalism and diversity. They're really great. They're happy about it, but they don't. They, Islam is a, is a unique beast in that regard. We're, we're happy with other multiculturalism, but Muslims is still an issue. And that manifests in things like not liking the hijab. And also uh, study after study has shown that Muslim women are far more likely to be the victims of verbal or physical Islamophobic abuse on the street, like much more so than men, many, many, many times more so than men. And I think there is a gendered element to that. I think one, it can be because they're more uh, identifiable if they wear certain religious clothing. But I also think because of the stereotype about who a Muslim woman is, you know, yep. she's meek, she's submissive. If you're the kind of person that wants to have a go at a Muslim, yeah. if you Think that's what a Muslim woman is compared to the six foot muscly yeah, you're, you're, you're going to punch head. down you're not going to punch up to me yeah right so there is that gendered element that being said though Islamophobia against Muslim men is also gendered because they're seen as violent misogynistic mm. you know like for example when we walk down the street I'm sure most people probably assume that I wear a hijab because my husband makes me like, and that is it. That's not just a comment on me. That's a comment on him. That's yeah. an opinion about what it means to be a Muslim man. Totally. Um, so there is both sides are, are quite gendered. So I want to, uh, my second to last question, I, I want to talk uh, a little more about the 2019 Christchurch massacre. And um, mm -hmm. It was not only important to you, it was actually, it was very important to me because my book, Fear of a Muslim Planet, um, 
actually centers the Christchurch massacre throughout it. And what I did in my research for the book was I actually wrote uh, small vignettes on all 51 of the victims from the oldest, who was a 70-year-old uh, Afghani uh, grandfather, to the youngest, a three-year-old uh, Black African uh, Somali toddler, uh, and, and everybody in between. And mm. the reason for me, uh, you know, as somebody who, who does this work on global Islamophobia, um, you know, the, the Christchurch shooter actually in his manifesto references the Great Replacement conspiracy theory, which has now since Christchurch actually been used as, um, as inspiration for other acts of not only Islamophobic terrorism, but anti-Semitic terrorism. Uh, uh, anti-Hispanic terrorism. There was a, a mass shooting here in Texas where 22 Latinos and Hispanics were killed at a Walmart superstore. And the guy in his manifesto said that, that uh, I support the Christchurch's Christchurch, Christchurch shooters manifesto. My attack today is because of the Hispanic invasion of uh, the United States. And so I talk about the Great Replacement a lot. And uh, and and the 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 resonance that not only this terrorist had. From this one act of terror, you know, in in a corner of the world known as Christchurch, New Zealand, um, but but well, tell us a little bit more about how it impacted you, how it impacted uh, Australian Muslims, and and I'm actually I I'd, I'd like you to unpack a little bit more. Like you would think that after a, a terrorist attack like that, that that allyship would increase, that people would actually come out and say, hey, oh, you know, we were wrong about Muslims the whole time. But if you're saying that you know attacks have gone up since then, like that, I want to I want to I want to hear a little bit more about how Christchurch uh, impacted you. Yeah, I remember you doing that in your book and it was such a beautiful and I think really important inclusion. And and I that's, you know, one of the reasons why I appreciate this question is because we can talk about Islamophobia, we can talk about all the statistics and waves and patterns, but in the end, these are people's lives and people's stories and these have personal impact. This is not just, an, these are not just abstract ideas. These have real world consequences on on how people live and unfortunately die. Yeah. Um, so in terms of my own personal experience, you know, um, well, my, my family's from New Zealand. My mum spent, my mum was a New Zealander, all my family's in New Zealand. So, um, you know, I, I guess I felt a personal horror and connection and watching it play out. Yeah. Uh, because I remember, you know, we started to see these reports that there were attacks at mosques at, at Friday prayer. And we're like, oh, what's going on there? You and know, well, you know, what we also forget, Susan, is that he was actually live streaming it on Facebook Live, and and some of us actually had to watch that horrifying video before. Like, I mean, like he wanted it. Was, it was meant to be a spectacle, right? It was meant to be yeah, a that's right. global thing. I'm sorry to go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was a performance. It was. It, you know, it was a performance of of horror. Um, you know, the very definition of, of terrorism, sending a message in that way. Um, so it was personally awful, you know, as a Muslim, as an Australian, as someone who's half Kiwi as well. Um, and what was, uh, it was horrible to watch the Australian Muslim community uh, respond because, I, again, you know, if we talk about the gendered element as well, because this was at Juma, this is something that would have been, I imagine, uniquely frightening for men as well. Because, you know, as we know, men are supposed to go to Juma for the mosque. Women can go if they want to. They don't have to. So obviously, tragically, women were killed in this terrorist attack as well. But I know Juma, that for Juma, some... Juma, by the way, is Friday prayer for our yeah. rock members who are not. Yeah. Um, and I know after that happened, there was a fear amongst men about going to Juma, like yeah. next Oh no! I mean, uh, like in the United States, like every mosque that I knew, like they were hiring extra security, like thousands of, like 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 packing full heat. Uh, yeah, it, it was like that all over the world. And so, what was surprising? I mean, I suppose Muslims will say, "Well, this wasn't surprising. This was always destiny." Two days after the Christchurch terrorist attack, all the mosques in the state of Victoria had already planned a year earlier that we were going to have mosque open day. Yeah. So. The it was uh just pure coincidence um and there was com like talk amongst some mosques should we not have it what should we do anyway we went ahead and I went to to my local mosque um you know I've been to many of these events and it was absolutely packed like so many mosques were people were bringing flowers they were coming and crying it was there were, it was standing room only we couldn't fit ever any everyone in it was which was lovely like so there was that you know you ask about well where was the solidarity 
there was that as well. You know, these are the these are the complicated and messy um, things that happen in these situations is that it gives permission to the people and encouragement to the people that want to be hateful and awful, but it can also reveal the best in people. And I think it made people feel um people who maybe hadn't non-muslims who maybe hadn't really thought about how this could end up or where the words we say can lead um so in some ways it also made muslims feel safer so my husband works in tv he's a tv presenter and he went he was sent to christchurch as part of his tv work to report on what was happening and he said you know it was time for me to pray i think it was the horror asr one of the the ritualistic daily Mm -hmm. prayers muslims have to do and it was he said it was time for me to do that and so I went just to pray in a park and it was actually the safest I've ever felt praying in a public park in a Western country because I felt like finally people were starting to see Muslims were not just being seen as perpetrators. Up until that point, Muslims were only being seen as perpetrators. And finally, people were considering that maybe we could be the victims as well, that we weren't always just the bad guy, that maybe we were people who needed to be protected as well. And so he said for the first time I felt like I could go and perform the Salat in the park and not worry that someone might come and spit at me or kick me. Um, so there was there was that significant change and it's meant that Australia really has, I mean, you, you could certainly argue not as well as we should. Right-wing extremism is absolutely growing in Australia and it's a big concern for our security agencies. But I do like to think, maybe that's just because I'm optimistic and hopeful of that, it was a turning point that Australia finally had to consider itself in a way that it hadn't wanted to before. It had to have look hard at itself in the mirror and, and look at the direction it was going and the kind of people that it was generating. And also just to see the idiocy of the way we would always ask Muslims, condemn terrorism, condemn terrorism, condemn terrorism, what are you doing? And how I would never have, after Christchurch, gone to my neighbour and said, well, you're a white Australian, so why are you not apologising? Of course you're not responsible for what he did. So hopefully it could also help people reframe uh, the way we think about a lot of things. You know, my last question to you, Susan, you know, when, when we when we met here in Washington, D.C. for coffee, you were actually making your way all around town talking to people about what works in terms of countering Islamophobia is it you know is it getting to know your neighbor is it sort of focus groups and is it media what you know in in all of your journeys in 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 discussing sort of global Islamophobia with experts around the world uh you know what I want to end on a hopeful note like what what do you see is working uh in many parts of the world and and what do you see for the future uh you know in terms of global Islamophobia yeah, that's right. We met uh, at a coffee shop in DC. I think we had a fight about who was going to pay from memory. You, you, <laughs> that you, was... won. you won. You won. Um, that's right. I met you. I was on a Churchill Fellowship, which is a fellowship that's funded. They funded me to go overseas, the UK and the US, just to okay. investigate this and bring these ideas back. And I have to say, I went, you'll probably laugh at my naivety, but I went on this trip honestly hoping and <laughs> thinking well, I'm going to go over to the US and the UK where they're so advanced and they've been doing this for so long. There's going to be one solution to how we tackle Islamophobia that works 100% of the time and I'm just going to bring that idea back to Australia and it'll be problem solved. Um, you'll be shocked to hear that is not what I found out. Oh my gosh. Disappointingly, there is no silver bullet to countering Islamophobia. And Hashtag facts. A couple- <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it was interesting because... Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that one is that all the people I spoke to and I spoke to Muslims and non-Muslims I spoke to people in the Jewish community as well to say how do you fight anti-semitism what can we learn and the thing is that even how people define what the problem is is different so if you like where is the line so what I mean by that is people some people interestingly Muslim religious scholars that I spoke to would say to me regularly people should be free to be able to criticize Islam. If someone wants to come out and write a book saying why Islam is a false religion, they should be allowed to do that. Whereas other people I spoke to were much more at the other end and saying, you know, I want you to feel that if a Muslim moves in next door to you, you see that as no different to a nurse or a teacher. It's a totally neutral thing. Right. Anything less than that is a problem that we need to solve. And so when it depends on where people even saw the problem is, okay. you know, what is, what are the things that we should be allowing and what should we be trying to change? So there is that 
challenge on what to do, but also what I found speaking to, I spoke to a lot of people, a lot of experts, and they all really disagreed with each other about what the most important role is. Is it presenting facts? Is it just getting to know a Muslim person? Is it teaching them about Islam? Is it not worrying about any of that and just presenting Muslims as humans through the arts? And they would disagree with each other as well. Often the people I spoke to said, yeah, this other organization does that, but that's a waste of time. And they'd say that about each other, not meanly, but just like, no, sure. this is what this is. And I think what I realized it comes down to is there is no silver bullet and there is no one cause of Islamophobia. So what works for one person is not going to work for another person. What's going to yeah. change someone's mind or open their mind isn't going to work for another person. And so we actually need this broad net of different approaches. And also what it comes down to is for the person doing it, mm-hmm. what do they feel passionate about and what are they good at? Some people are really good at the factual stuff, whatever. That should be where they're at. Other people, they're just much more personable. And yeah. this is their skill set. And they just want to have a cup of tea with the lady next door and get to know as humans and, and build those human connections. And that's what they're good at. And that's what's going to work in that situation. So we actually need all these different approaches okay. because it this is a really messy, complex, you know, quote unquote, wicked problem that needs all the different approaches and all of them will find their audience somewhere. The things that never work in my, from what I've sensed, generally mocking someone, making fun of them, like just being um, awful to someone being like, well, you're, if you think that you're a friggin' idiot, no one's going to like, that's, that's never going to change no, someone's mind. Um, so you, you, we all need to have this attitude of wanting to build a bridge or connect, but um there, it is a wide ocean and it necessarily has to be and there need to be a million different paths. As one of the religious scholars I spoke to said, in Islam, we have 54 different ways to recite the Quran. We have always been comfortable with difference and we need different approaches for this as well. Dr. Susan Carland, I would like to thank you for joining me today on this episode of Unpacking Islamophobia. Thank you for having me, Arsalan. I have loved it. For our audience, thank you for joining us as well. For more information, please visit bridge.georgetown.edu. Thank you very much.